So I'm extremely grateful and honored today because I'm actually seated in Gracie Mansion with the first lady of New York City. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm, I'm blessed. Well, I'm so grateful that you invited me to do this. This is wonderful and I'm happy that you're here. <laughs> and I, thank you so much. And I'm even more excited because we're speaking about this amazing coalition that you've launched, mm -hmm. which is seeking to drive mental health reform both locally and nationally across America. And you've just finished a conference on this topic. I mean, how was it? Please tell us. The conference was phenomenal, and I feel there was so much excitement that I feel like it hasn't ended because we've been hearing back from people, and people are actually signing up to be a part of this coalition right now. We have already have more than 30 cities uh, want to be par officially part of it, and we know that we're going to get hundreds of more, so I, I, I couldn't be more excited. It's a really critical time uh, in, in our nation and, and locally to make change in mental health uh, in terms of the changing the culture and expanding services that are available to all of us and people have a real opportunity to get involved right now. That's unbelievable and I think everyone who's watching wherever you're tuning in from in the world but especially those of you in America we really want you to find those opportunities today and we'll find out ways that you can get activated and involved and this is really a passion project for you. This yes, is something is. that you're deeply connected with mm -hmm. and can you tell us where that comes from and how what you're hoping to achieve? Well, the, the passion is personal, I and mean, as, as with most people, I, I came to it through experiences in my life um, growing up and experiences within my own family, friends, colleagues. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not a, um, it's not a coincidence that I've been, uh, I've had so many experiences with alcoholism, schizophrenia, bipolar disease, uh, depression, anxiety, and I often tell the story of, of our daughter who came to us just a couple of years ago and said she had been diagnosed with anxiety and depression and addiction and so it, it couldn't be closer to home for me I, and I really see that how it is the our, our inability to treat and provide services or our lack of providing uh, the right attention and services is at the root of so many of our, our other challenges in life whether it's you know, education or uh, physical health care, that if we just paid attention uh, to this more, we would, well, first of all, people would feel better and be healthier, but we would also be able, we wouldn't have so many of these severe problems that we see on the streets. We let people go without care and they become seriously ill. And then it's very difficult to, to help them. Definitely. And why don't you tell us about some of the amazing work that you already started doing in New York City? I was reading yes. about it earlier and, you know, I was reading the statistics that almost brought this coalition as a response of one in five New York adults That's suffering right. from mental health disorders. What's already happening in New York? That's right. I, I think it's so important for people to understand how common um, this is. It's one in five is, it's at least one in five. Some people use a bigger number. Certainly in, in, in high need communities, that number is, is higher. Um, and, and that is, um, and folks have to understand that we can provide treatment and services. So that's why we started this in New York. Everywhere, everywhere I went, I would ask people, who in this room has not had some personal experience or through your family or personally with uh, mental illness or substance use disorders? Uh, please raise your hand. And no one would ever raise their hand, and that really brought home that number for me. So we started work on changing the culture, uh, being able to, um, well, encouraging people to speak openly and honestly about mental illness and substance misuse, and also thinking about how we can provide services in a way that people feel more comfortable. And this is a this is a citywide conversation that we're having with with the clergy members, with the academics, and all kinds of people because it's so important for everyone to be part of this change. I've got a question coming in here that says actually that you've obviously been supported by both Democrats and Republicans. Yes. I mean, how's yes. that been? Well, and also, what are, you, how, what are you hoping that's going to help to achieve? Well, it, I mean, it totally makes sense. This is about uh, you know, our children, it's about our families. It's not a red issue, a blue issue, a big city issue, or a small city issue. It really involves all of us. And I am just so grateful to have support for such a, a, a wide base of people. Uh, on this, and I'm encouraged that because it is 
uh, a bipartisan issue that we're seeing movement with mental health reform in Congress. Right now, as, as we sit here, there is movement uh, to actually pass legislation to um, provide, well, to expand services within our country. Is there anything particular that's happened in the past few days over the conference? Mm -hmm. Any highlights or any moments where you just felt, that's why I'm doing this? Or, you know, was, <laughs> it, was there any like, things that you can remember, or any connection? Oh, th there are many. There really are many. I, I, I think that um, the, the, the first moment was just walking into the room with, you know, a couple hundred folks who are all very focused and passionate on this issue and just feeling the exhilaration and the uh, uh, focused attention and and you know how food tastes really good when you're really hungry well this conference was kind of was a kind of an example of that or a metaphor for that because well there has not been this kind of gathering for, from my understanding ever to talk about how cities can lead in this area. So people really wanted to be there and really wanted to engage in a tangible way to moving their city forward and expanding services and, and having this public conversation. Shaleen's saying, what if someone is depressed or has a mental illness in our community? How do we start a conversation? So very grassroots mm -hmm. question there. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things, I mean, people, we, we heard this question a lot and, and that's one of the reasons, you know, Thrive is like 54 different programs. One of the most important programs is mental health first aid. This is a, a, a course that you can do wherever you, uh, you can take wherever you live. You can bring it to your city and have different folks host it all over and, and it helps educate people, uh, helps raise their awareness about uh, anxiety, depression, all of these different diseases which affect so many of us. Help people understand what the signs and symptoms are and what to do about it. You know, if, do you have a friend who's been suddenly talking about uh, taking his or her own life? Like, what do you do? I mean, this is very practical information that we just don't have at our fingertips the way we do with physical health. Like if you're bleeding, you know, we know, oh, you apply pressure, <laughs> exactly. you raise your, the limb above your heart. I mean, there are things that we grow up understand. We can do this with mental health, but people have to, you know, they have to learn. Uh, mental health first aid, you can go online and, and check it out. You can go to uh, nyc.gov slash thrive nyc and learn more about it. Uh, and again, I encourage everyone to take this course. When I took it, it really just set a light bulb off of my head. I understood a lot more about my family members and friends who have been suffering and I understood uh, what what we, what we can do about it as individuals and, and learn more about like how we can refer people for, for more help if need be. So that's a great step that anyone watching at home can yeah. take part in straight away. What else do you mm -hmm. suggest that the person, the audience watching at home today or mm -hmm. at work, wherever you are, what can they start doing today that can help them get involved and be a part of this change? Well, it's, I'll say two things. One, t just talking about it is a big move. You know, so everywhere I go, I say I talk about this subject, and afterwards, you know, people come up to me, and it's always in whispers and in the corner of the room, because even though we've come a long way, we there's still a stigma, right? And there's still mm. a stigma about this. But my speaking openly about it helps other people be, share their stories with me, even if they're not ready to talk to maybe a room full of people. And I under I totally understand that. But the more people we can get to stand up, speak out online, offline wherever it's just I think it's really helpful in just igniting that public conversation the other thing people can do right now is to talk uh, get in touch with their members of Congress uh, in their local offices you don't have to go to Washington DC uh, go to the home office of your member of Congress write a letter let them know that you want we want mental health reform, that this is a priority and that it's urgent. They need to hear this right now because, uh, as I said, it's a bipartisan issue, but because it's something that so many people just don't talk about, they don't understand how widespread the need is and how widespread the concern is that you know, we get this done. Completely. Why do you think this is such an important issue for us to be talking about, especially for our future generations? How is this going to mm -hmm. affect uh, our children and children's children and, and future? No, well, again, it, it, because it is so common and because it is the root of so many of our problems, I mean, we often talk about disruptive classrooms, you know, children who um, can't control their behavior or, or are um, walking with trauma and just can't seem to get a grip, right? And, and you know, learning, uh, social emotional learning, which is part of mental health, learning to, uh, learning mindfulness, 
learning how to make good choices, learning how to de-escalate. I mean, all of these things can be taught. Uh, so, so important to give our children uh, these foundational less lessons so they can be resilient through life. I mean, life is tough, right? <laughs> For all of us, we're all gonna have challenges, but the more we know about how to handle emotional stress, the better off we all will be. So I, um, you know, this is something I'm, I'm fighting for. I think that, you know, we all can benefit from more information about mental health and the mind-body connection because uh, it's, it, it's good for our whole body. <laughs> yeah, completely, yeah, completely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's so great that so many people like yourselves are change makers and coming out as advocates and ambassadors mm -hmm. so that people are finding it more comfortable to just yeah. open up and have these conversations which seems to be the hardest point it which almost hard. seems to be that fear of just overcoming that mm -hmm. that tiny hurdle is almost restricting all this growth that's and, right and support for so many people that's right i think speaking out and reaching out those are first steps to mm -hmm. actually making change are there any particular people or anything that you've seen that also you feel inspired by? People making a stand about mm -hmm. this work. Is there anything that inspires you? Oh, you know, we, there's people have been working on this for decades and decades, and and I, you know, I, I could give you so many names. I'd hate to leave anyone else, but sure. you know, Rosalind Carter did this work long, long ago, and she's still working at it. Um, uh, Tipper Gore, Hillary Clinton. Uh, I just spoke to uh, Representative Tim Murphy. I've had co two conversations with him in the last days. You know, these are you know people in the public sphere uh, who have been so brave and so uh, persistent uh, in their work that there are so many others. There, there are celebrities who are doing this, Glenn Close, for example, um, sports figures. There are a lot of people out there doing it, but what we need right now, I think, is a, a coordinated effort, and which is why Cities Thrive is, is so important, showing that we can come together as elected officials, as um, members of organizations like NAMI and, and, and government, uh, mayors, you can all do and this and, and, and move in one direction, which is forward. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely, right. definitely. And it's, it's great for Cities Thrive to be at the forefront of that mm -hmm. and really bringing communities together. And from what I was reading and learning, just getting people to actually turn that feeling and emotion into action. That's and right. actually getting them out there and making that difference. Yeah, helping yeah. people feel their power. I mean, the power of the people is is in the streets. It's out, you know, outside of the uh, these buildings. This is we are the ones who can make this change happen. Yeah. Unbelievable. What a beautiful message. So many positive comments coming through. What does that make you feel? And what are you hoping that, that people are now like, going to go and it, do? It makes me feel like we're doing the right thing and I and I hope that everyone will take this uh, this conversation that we're having today, and and do something tangible with it. You know, speak out, contact their elected officials, especially their member of Congress, because uh, it's so important. Definitely, and mm -hmm. we've just had this question coming now as well. Is that asking about de-escalation and defining mm -hmm. it? De-escalation. Um, that I, I was speaking specifically about when people um, have an emotion that's very very strong, and they can't seem to get out of it, right? They're at that, that point of, of rage or, um, or even, or fear even, and, and like how to talk somebody down mm -hmm. from so that they can move forward, whether it's, you know, uh, they're having, uh, they're mad, they're just mad. Like, how do you get them to not be mad, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yeah, completely. Yeah, that's what de-escalation is about. We're, we, you know, we're doing that work with our, our police officers um, to help, uh, Teach, for teaching them to de-escalate situations that have gotten so tense that like you can't have a conversation with somebody. You can't figure out like, well, what's really going on here if they're in this state of emotional distress that is so intense. So that's what de-escalation is about, is getting people, I, I don't wanna say like to calm down, but that's kind of what it is uh, about. I truly believe that this is one message that in a time when there may be divides, when there may be mm -hmm. Uh, conflict of interest or conflict of thoughts, this is something that we can all get behind. This is something that That's can really right. uni unify us. That's right, and yeah. make us all better as individuals and, and for our family and communities as well. Because yeah. this is not something, this is not like an individual issue. Because if someone is suffering, it affects all of us. Completely. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful opportunity. It's been an honor okay. and pleasure speaking with you today, genuinely. Once again, like I said, I've been joined and I've been speaking with the First Lady of New York City, 
all around this mental health coalition, Cities Thrive. Please do check it out online. Please do get involved in this change-making movement. Get involved, take action, and make some change in your city, local or global, national, wherever it is. Uh, let's get going. But thank you so much again. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care, guys.